special time right here and now. I don't think, this is never, the, the people that are in the room right here, not just the people up here, but all of you in the audience, this is the first time we've gotten together for a meeting like this to really talk about 3D printing and personal manufacturing in one room. Fundamental premise behind the way we made stuff was never going to allow us to optimize manufacturing the way we needed to. Well, we can take that 15, 20 piece assembly and we can redesign it with great software and get it down to a single piece. I think 3D printing is, is the tip of the iceberg of a larger scale phenomenon which is personal manufacturing. You cannot really imagine what the, what the creativity of people is when you give them access to this technology. And when you want something, rather than immediately thinking, okay, where am I going to go buy that? You think, hmm, maybe I can make a buy. The cool thing about the technology is that you can actually bring manufacturing back to close to where the consumers are. So if we can do the content and have the affordable solutions that will help the consumer, if we can get it into education, that will ensure that people know what to ask for when they grow up. Uh, you know, I tell my students that in, in uh, maybe 20 or 30, 40 years, uh, they'll have a hard time explaining to their grandchildren how they live without a 3D printer. But there's sort of these absolutely normal things that can happen when that well they're, well, they're totally fantastic, but they become absolutely normal when you have a 3D printer. For enabling creativity, we also need to create an environment for everybody to be creative. People who have the power to make decisions, make policy, create funding, to a large extent, don't get this. And until they do, we're going to have trouble growing. Um, when they do, it's going to get a whole lot easier. And as this stuff matures and gets more usable and there are more desktops, it's going to become less and less about access to capital and more of work about what you know. Uh, in the end, this is sort of a, a big snowball rolling downhill. And to pretend as if it doesn't exist is the worst mistake we can make. If we never have to go to a mall again, who are the real winners there? <laughs> like reverse engineering a car engine and, and, and making the parts of the car engine better and then selling that. And then for some reason the car engine blows up. Who's at fault here? And which car engine did blow up? And which, which was the part which made it go wrong? Are there going to be product liability issues that we have to think about? Uh, are there going to be other IP constraints? Getting those on the table now and thinking about them in advance might help us keep them from becoming barriers to the growth of the industry. One of the things that I think is so interesting about the technology is just how much potential this has to be disruptive. To me, personal scale manufacturing technologies are disruptive because they are meta technologies. When you have a physical world, it's so different than a digital world in so many ways. One of the ways is, is an important legal way which is unlike the digital world where so much of it, almost by default, is protected by copyright just by the nature of what it is. The physical world doesn't have those sorts of automatic protections from birth. And then they go, wow, I can make money off of this. And then the next question is, but what if someone copies it? And suddenly they've just woken up to the whole world of IP law. You look at Thingiverse, you look at other communities like that, where it's very important to cite things. It's very important to say, this is where I got an idea from. It is not critical that you pay a licensing fee. There is something really compelling and fun to make. When people want to get something done, they learn the technology. Yeah. <laughs>